Continuing on, on page 269, we have the three ways of coming to a decisive experience of awareness. So the first of those, he says, now hold to your place, your own place, as a supreme, unwavering state of equalness. From the root text concerning phenomena that manifest as myriad sense objects without thinking in any way, this is how to rest. Rest spontaneously in the naturally settled state free of proliferation and resolution of thoughts. Abide as a, ma a manner, matter, of course, within the expanse of equalness, the true nature of phenomena. And then down a little ways, he quotes from the All-Creating Monarch, resting in the natural state without seeking anything, without any specific method concerning how or when, that is meditation. Then the second one, you also hold to your own place as the unobstructed state of natural lucidity in all its nakedness. So from the root text, neither focusing your senses on nor letting your gaze wander to the manifestations of sensory ob appearances in all their variety, neither thinking of self or nor conceiving of other, rest naturally lucid in the supremely spacious state of complete openness. So just a non-conceptual state of mind. Then the third one, the next page, freedom from restrictions is extolled as the infinitely even state of spaciousness. So from the root text, given the enlightened intent of naturally occurring timeless awareness in which everything is equal, expansive and elevated mind free of the proliferation and resolution of thoughts, the experience of blending with space without any division into outer and inner or in between arises as meditative absorption that is blissful, clear, and free of elaboration. So then his commentary down here, uh, he explains how to go about this a little bit. So on that second line, hold your upper body erect, let your gaze rest openly by focusing your eyes on the space in front or in a far distance. You can alternate between these. Allow your awareness to expand. Let your five senses remain naturally expansive. By meditating this way, you pass into an openness in which there is no division between outer and inner or in between. Meditative experiences arise of your physical body blending with space, of states of bliss, clarity, and non-conceptual awareness, or of a supreme, unobstructed state of naked awareness. You may feel that all sensory appearances become transparent or that your consciousness becomes unobstructed and completely open, with no trace of thoughts remaining or that anything can and does arise within a state that is nothing whatsoever in itself, since you have experienced everything decisively as empty, free of restriction, and unobstructed. You may feel that no matter how you analyze and contemplate, you cannot find any thoughts by searching for them. That is now impossible for, uh, for them to occur, that they never did occur, and that no one, has, uh, no one has them at present. You may ask yourself, what is this, what is all this talk about so many thoughts? <laughs> They're all gone. Uh, top of the next page, meditative experiences of unobstructed awareness arise in a way that cannot be expressed within words. So then we go on to five major ways of making clear distinctions. So here he's talking about major criteria for making these clear distinctions to help dispel limitations imposed by conceptual doubts. So one of those is resting within naturally occurring enlightened intent as a method for purifying samsara. So from the root text, given the enlightened intent to the true nature of phenomena, which never strays from a state of rest, the ground of being, there is no division into outer and inner, for that nature is free of the elaborations of dualistic perception. There is no ordinary mind fixating on something other in a sense of object, or in a sense object, so nothing is reified as an object, and your perceptions of the universe are free of fixation. 
No context exists for taking rebirth in samsara. This is similar to space. So our awareness is just not reified in terms of an object, even though those manifest in what we observe or do. So then he talks a little more, given that no context exists for taking rebirth in samsara, there is no inner concept of mind as self. So nothing is reified as a subject, and the all-consuming thought patterns of conditioned existence are stilled. The potential for rebirth in samsara is cut through at the root. At that point, you have arrived at the enlightened intent of dharmakaya, like space, in which there is no division into outer and inner, no frame of reference for phenomena based on confusion. You have touched on the point of resolution, and since there is no coming or going, everything is an infinite expanse, the pure realm of Samatabhadra. You have reached the sublime palace of Dharmakaya. So you're no longer thinking about, analyzing, trying to understand. You get it. It just is. There are a couple of comments here down toward the bottom of that same page. There is no place to go, only a unique state of Buddhahood. When awareness is involved with ordinary mind, we speak of an ordinary being. And when it is free of ordinary mind, we speak of a Buddha. On the next page, and just a little below the, the middle of the page, he quotes from the dynamic, the perfect dynamic energy of the lion. Lion is probably a reference to the Buddha. By their very nature, ignorant and spiritually undeveloped people try persistently to tie space into knots. <laughs> that that was a really good quote. That's, can we get tangled up in all of this stuff, trying to figure it all out. Let it go. Let go and let be. Going over to page 276. By making a clear distinction concerning awareness and its natural state of rest, you can differentiate it from a one-pointed state of calm abiding. So from the root text, if awareness in the moment does not stray from the ground of being, familiarization with that experience negates any furthering of conditioned existence. You are free of the karma and habitual patterns that perpetuate rebirth. You have come to the decisive experience of causality described as the equalness of samsara and nirvana. You have arrived at the heart essence of enlightenment which does not abide in conditioned existence or the state of peace. It is crucial that you distinguish between this and a one-pointed state of calm abiding. This is the enlightened intent of natural great perfection. So again, he's going back to understanding the differences of between the uh, subtle differences between these. So in his commentary there, he continues, awareness abiding in its natural state of rest has the quality of being naked, unobstructed awareness. This can be differentiated from a one-pointed state of calm abiding, the quality of abiding without thoughts proliferating. As you become familiar with that state of awareness, the karma and habitual patterns that perpetuate rebirth fall away by virtue of the cessation of ordinary mind. Your present familiarity with awareness free of ordinary mind ultimately makes dharmakaya, which is also free of ordinary mind, fully evident. All moments in which you have experienced awareness free of ordinary mind are identical in that awareness does not stray from the ground of being. So and so the auspicious circumstances for the fruition becoming fully evident arise as you extend the flow of awareness moment by moment. Then on the middle of the next page, the, a clear distinction can be made between the ground of all ordinary experience and dharmakaya. So it's continuing this same theme here. In the root text, if you stray from your fundamental nature, the function of conceptual mind is samsara, pure and simple. It involves cause and effect. You have not come to the decisive experience. A person who makes this mistake falls lower and lower. 
Therefore, the sublime secret, great perfection, does not stray from basic space. And the expressions of dynamic energy resolve within the ground of being. Enlightened intent abides in an unwavering state of equalness. So in the commentary below that, he talks about this essence of awareness is dharmakaya. So we need to be very clear about that in terms of terminology. It's sometimes easy to get caught up in terms and, and think, oh, this is something different or something else. But many of these terms are actually referring to the same thing. And then in that next paragraph, the ground of all ordinary experience is a non-conceptual neutral state in which there is no realization of bare awareness. This blocks true meditative stability. So again, that ordinary experience as opposed to the understanding or realization of pure awareness. Then on 278, down the third paragraph starts Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya is bare awareness elicited in all its nakedness, free of elaboration, empty yet lucid. As Dharmakaya, it is empty in its essence. As Sambhokakaya, it is lucid by nature. As Nirmanakaya, it is the unceasing ground for the arising of things. At the bottom of the page, last paragraph there, in this approach, having identified unobstructed awareness, you gain the fundamental state of Dharmakaya. Since you have no expectation that the non-conceptual state of calm abiding is meditation, maybe put meditation in quotes there, the ground of all ordinary experience is undermined. So you just abide constantly in timeless awareness of the three kayas. So the essence is of Dharmakaya is that awareness. They are the same, one and the same. Dharmakaya is awareness, awareness is Dharmakaya. Um, on page 281 down, I don't know, let's see, third paragraph, I guess it is, kind of in the middle of that, it is timeless awareness because it is awareness that abides thus as Dharmakaya timelessly. On to page 283 just above the root text there. Another clear distinction lies in gaining certainty about causality. So from the root text within this context, there is no cause and effect, no concerted effort. View, for example, cannot be cultivated in meditation. Although the mode of cessation is described as having neither center nor limit, when dynamic energy itself deviates from this natural state, the myriad display arises as the multiplicity of the universe of appearances and possibilities. So never say categorically, there is no cause and effect. So we have to be a little bit careful Okay. There is the manifestation, the different levels of manifestation here, if you will. But things still do manifest that we refer to in ordinary sense as the universe. Okay? And so in the universe, there are cause and effect. And it does exist. So down at the bottom of the page, it says, you might ask, how do these appearances manifest? So from the root text, Interdependence ensures that conditioned composite phenomena are beyond enumeration and imagination. Confused perception and samsara, and even states of peace and bliss, are beyond enumeration and imagination. All of this constitutes the very process of interdependence, which is the coming together of causes and conditions. And then at the bottom of 284, a clear distinction can be made by coming to a decisive experience concerning causality. If you evaluate your fundamentally unconditioned nature, you find it has never existed as anything whatsoever. So too, in taking this as your path, you have no frame of reference whatsoever for straying from that fundamentally unconditioned nature in all its immediacy. Rather, 
you appreciate it within the context of enlightened intent, having reached the ultimate state in the immediacy of your fundamentally unconditioned nature, you are not sullied by anything at all. It just is. So within that context, enlightened intent of abiding in Dharmakaya is timeless awareness. Nothing whatsoever has ever existed in an ultimate sense. Nothing permanent. The bottom, he quotes from the perfect dynamic energy of the lion again, Dharmakaya is the non-conceptual, naturally pristine state of meditation. It is not an objective construct, and if one realizes the ultimate meaning of this, one experiences the supreme state of meditative stability that is not made or unmade. It's beyond either made or unmade. Continuing on page 286. Now the ultimate meaning of all these sections can be summarized as the true nature of phenomena beyond causality and conscious striving. So from the root text, afflictive emotions, karma, habitual patterns have no support within this vast expanse, but are the playing out of magical games of illusion. You must be liberated from this, so please come to a decisive experience of causality. As a means of doing so, there is nothing superior to this approach. Therefore, it is crucial not to stray from the enlightened intent of the true nature of phenomena, Dharmakaya. This is the expanse of my profound and heartfelt advice. It is crucial to go beyond what everything is or is not, transcending is and is not. So he quotes then finally from the all-creating monarch at the top of 287. Desiring happiness is the illness of attachment. It is through an absence of desire that one gains happiness. Buddhahood does not happen by being made to happen. It is unsought and naturally indwelling and so is spontaneously present. Rest non-conceptually in this effortless, natural abiding, naturally abiding state. So this chapter brings together the definitive key points for putting this approach into practice. Now you might say, well, there's a lot of repetition in here, and certainly there is quite a bit of that. But uh, through that, we begin stronger and stronger to really get the key points that he's trying to emphasize here. Without thinking about them, they just naturally are, and we get it. And so then we can apply that in our practice, we can apply that in our everyday lives. <laughs>